If you just came in, there's uh, sheets of paper that are on these two tables that you could pick up, pick up a copy. And so this is uh, Computer Science 221, um, like it says on the sign. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, we are meeting today on the ancestral and traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, okay, let's start with introductions. Um, so uh, my name is, is uh, Will. And you can call me Will. Uh, uh, please don't call me, uh, or you can if you want. You can call me, you know, you can call me Dr. Evans if you'd like to, or you can call me Professor Evans if you'd like to, but Dr. Evans is like my dad. And <laughs> Professor Evans is like my grandmother. And you know, it's sort of, anyway, this is better. Um, I teach this section, I teach this course, sections of this course twice. So for example, if you miss this class, you can sort of reverse time and go back to the class that's taught at 10 o'clock in the morning. Or if you don't want to come to this class, you can go to that class. Or you can go to Cinda's class. Cinda's great. Um, anyway, they're all the same content. We're trying to keep ourselves in sync. And it's just that the slides might be a little different and what's said in each of the classes might be a little different. Okay, but you're free to go wherever you wish for these for, for getting these courses. Um, there's uh, a lot of TAs in the course, and I don't even know what their names are, so I can't introduce the TAs to you because I don't know who they are yet. In fact, the first TA meeting is happening in one hour and ten minutes. Um, but they will be there on the website. Their pictures and their names will be there eventually. That's the website. It also contains, will contain all of the lectures. So all of the lecture notes that I show you with the scribbles that I scribble on them if I scribble. So the annotated lecture notes, they will have, actually I'm recording this right now. Uh, yeah, you're looking around, it's right there. I'm recording it. Just the slides and my voice uh, will be on the website where the lecture notes are. So if you really like don't want to come to class, you can always get the material there, but it's better to go to class just because it's an opportunity to interact with people and with me and to ask questions and to learn things in person that it's very, very hard to replicate <laughs> digitally without any feedback. So I encourage you to look at that as a resource, but uh, sort of like a last resort resource. And I encourage you to come to class because um, I want this to be a discussion and I want to understand what you're getting and what I'm not getting across to you. And if you have questions, you ask. Uh, okay, that's one thing is the website. There's another thing which is uh, Piazza. And so. Some people have already signed up for Piazza, but if you go to the website, then you'll find the link to Piazza, and you can sign up for Piazza. Um, at least I hope it's there. I remember putting it there, but maybe, anyway, I'll, I'll check. Um, the syllabus is also on the website, so if you have questions exactly about the syllabus, but we'll talk through some of the overall, the big picture things uh, today. Uh, and also, if you have any questions at any point, you know, please feel free to ask me. Um, oh yeah, and I forgot. In the first time I taught this, like just this morning. Um, by the way, that's not the first time I've taught this class, but it's the first time I've taught this semester. Uh, I forgot to mention that, um, you know, you're paying money for this class. And this class isn't for me. 
It's for you. So if, for example, I happen to write something like Piazza on this slide and you can't read it, or I say something and you didn't hear it, ask. Raise your hand and say, I didn't hear you. I don't know what you just read, wrote there, but it's not anything I can read. Um, I've had teaching evaluations which say my handwriting is not the best. That's pretty much the best it's going to be. So if, <laughs> if you don't like that, then maybe you, well, I don't know what you could do. Maybe, maybe you could type. Maybe there's a way to do that. But anyway, that's what it's going to be like. It's like that. Um, but if you don't know what it is, then ask. That's the thing. OK. Um, let's see. So now you've got who I am. We don't know who the TAs are. But then there's also you guys. So there's a lot of you. And my capacity for learning names is not as good as it was. But I will try to learn your names over the course of the course. But the other thing that's important is that you all learn each other's names. So I'd like to take a moment or two right now for you to introduce yourselves to your neighbors. Just turn and say, hi, my name is, they're in the same boat, don't be nervous. <laughs> Like there's lots of stuff to tell people. Like I'm, you know, I'm a third year student. I'm doing this and this. And I'm a 36 year student, and uh, that's uh, it's kind of frightening, isn't it? Anyway, um, that's what I want this class. Uh, I think it would be a, a benefit to everyone in the class to have engagement from the class. So I will at some times be uh, like a circus uh, barker or whatever those people are that yell for things in front of circuses. Give the barker. Anyway, anyway, I'll be that kind of person to try to encourage people to come on, give me something. So that's when you like take pity on me and you <laughs> participate. Uh, but it's for your good, not for me. I mean, I know this stuff already. So anyway, here we go. Um, coursework. Let's get it over with. There's work in this course. That's the breakdown. So there are about 10 labs. So each lab is about 1%. There are about three written programming, written homeworks. That's about 5% each. There's about three programming projects. And when I say about three, it really means three because I don't have a fourth. At least I haven't invented it yet. So if we really, if you really want a fourth one, maybe. But I would have to invent it. I invented one, but it was way too hard. So they don't let me do that anymore. Uh, no, they do. The two midterms, 15% each, they're scheduled already for the evenings of October 10th and November 7th. Um, and the final exam is 25%. And no one knows where it is. And no one knows when it's going to be. Why is that? What kind of a university is this that can't schedule final exams so that we know when they are? What? It's crazy. I'll tell you why. You have a lot of flexibility when you sign up for courses. It doesn't matter what courses you sign up for unless they overlap in terms of their time. Like if you were trying to sit in this class and a class that was simultaneously meeting in Buchanan, it would not work. So you're free to do that. And after that's all done, and after all of the dust is settled on who's in which classes, they figure out a schedule for the final exams. And what do they do? 
They try to minimize overlaps. They try to minimize consecutive final exams. They try to minimize congestion based on the choices that people have made about what classes they're going to take. Because it's not so easy to schedule this. It's a hard problem, but it requires an algorithm, which is exactly what we talk about in this course. So I should be really happy about the fact that they don't set the final exams before the courses are set, because then you would only then you would be constrained not only to the time when the class meets, but also to the time when the final is, and you'd be looking at those and trying to it's crazy. So they optimize it for you using an algorithm. Those are the sorts of algorithms that we want to talk about in this class. We want to learn about those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, and you must pass a weighted combination of the exams to pass the course. Uh, any questions about this? This is like the 30,000 foot view. Yes. We don't have what? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sorry at all, really. Yeah, don't really Okay. <laughs> See, because I, I think you guys are pretty much adults. And so, if you want to come to class, come to class. If you want to sleep, sleep. It's up to you. If, I don't, if I'm not providing value to you coming to class, don't go. It's up to you. But if I'm not, there's another thing which you can do, which is to say, send me an email saying, you know what, your class is the worst ever. I don't want to go. I'm not coming anymore. And I'll say, okay, go to Cindy's class. She's a lot better than I am. More exciting. More Anyway. Or I can change things. Like you could say, I don't really like the way you do this. Too many jokes. Too much stuff that's not relevant to the class. Let's get down to business here and we're talking. Okay. Collaboration. You are not just May, but you... Oops. Not just May, but you are encouraged to... You don't have to if you don't want to, but you're encouraged to because there's evidence that suggests that I may not be the best teacher of you. It's the person sitting next to you that might be the best teacher for you. And if you get that input, as well as my input, as well as the TA's input, it seems to be a better mix. So I'm encouraging you to take advantage of the opportunity to do this sort of thing, but if you don't want to, that's okay. You can work together, but in teams of two. You can choose your teams of two. I'm not going to choose them for you. I, I don't know why I would. Um, there are, you can work together on written homeworks. You can work together on programming projects. You can work together on labs. Uh, if you do a written assignment, you submit one version. If you do a, pro, a programming assignment together, you submit one version. I don't know what you do with labs. I, maybe you submit one version? I have no idea. Uh, but I'll find out. There are no labs this week, so I've got a little bit of breathing room here. Okay, everybody got collaboration? Yes. Unless all partners be in the same section. No. You can choose anybody you'd like to partner with, unless there's somebody that's taken this course already, in which case you can't. Unless they're taking it again. In which case, they're probably sad. <laughs> yeah, you can partner across sections. You can partner anywhere you want. Any other questions about this collaboration policy? There's this little blurb down at the bottom that says you can collaborate with others. That means you can talk to other people in the class about your project, but don't write things down. Take it away as a conversation. Take a little break, and then you can write down what they say. I don't want people using this as an opportunity to copy from one group to the next. I mean, that's, that's not helping anybody, really. In the long run, you're not learning, and they're feeling ex um, used. Okay, uh, next. Uh, every day, every lecture, I mean, uh, I'll put up a slide that has announcements for the day and has a plan for the day. So this is that slide. We finally got to it. So, in fact, there's more to add to it, which... Oh, I already forgot something. Sorry, we have to go back. Uh, I forgot to tell you about textbooks. There are two textbooks. There's uh, one that's by Carano and Henry. 
And this is the one that's on data structures in C++. So this is sort of the C++ book. And then there's another one, which is by App, which you probably already have if you took 121. This is the textbook for that. Uh, and this is uh, uh, discrete math. And if, by chance, you don't happen to have these books, that's OK. It's not like I'm going to insist that you have a copy of this book. I'm never going to refer to question number 13.77 in one of those books. That's not the way it works. These are resources for you, and we think that they're reasonable resources. They're not perfect. They're reasonable. But if you find that something on the web works better for you, online resources, books that you already have, whatever, that's fine with me. These are just the ones that are for this course. Efficient. Is it good? Yeah. Could I write down the entire name? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yes. This is called Data Abstraction. Sorry. Abstraction um, and problem solving and probably this is on the web page but I like writing and this is discrete math with applications Is it good? Uh, any other questions about this? Is, we're sort of out of logistics at this point. So if you had questions about logistics, now is the time to ask. Oh. Okay, it's the afternoon, okay? Uh, I forgot something else. Uh, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> Unless I forget, in which case, too bad. All right, so we have uh, homework one, which is going to be available soon, is due uh, on Friday of next week. So typically you have one week for the written assignments and about two weeks for the programming assignments. So I think you might have three weeks for the middle programming assignment, at least if I'm remembering correctly. So, and the question was asked in the morning section, is it possible that we would have assignments that are out at the same time and overlapping, like a homework and a programming assignment at the same time? And I said, yes. In fact, we do that intentionally. And the reason we do it intentionally is so that you get the flexibility to do the scheduling you want. We're trying to give you, like, if I was my, was my I would give you all of the assignments now. It's just that I haven't written them. So I give all of you the, I give them as soon as I write them. Like assign like homework number one is almost done. Really. It should be out by Friday. It should be out by tomorrow. So and you know as soon as I get it out, I'll put it out. Then their due dates are gonna be not the same. It's the same there's no same due dates. But you have to budget your time between how much you're gonna spend on the written assignments and how much you're gonna spend on a programming assignment that you have at the same time. And I think that that's a good thing to do. It gives you flexibility. And it gives you more time to contemplate things like programming, programming assignments. And also to study for midterms. So it just doesn't pack unless we have a word. Okay? Yeah? Um, if programming assignments, should you be doing them like prepare for doing that same kind of work on the final? Or is that just isolated for the course? Uh, the question was, if we're doing programming assignments, should we do that to prepare for the final? Is it going to be on the final in some fashion or, or not? And the answer is, I'm not going to ask you to write code on the final that we're actually going to type into a computer and execute. But I am going to ask you questions on the final exam that you will, be, you will find easier to answer if you've done the programming assignments. At least I usually do that, or at least sometimes. That's the threat. 
Any other questions about logistics? Logistics is what we're talking about now. Okay. Um, there are no lab sections this week. Uh, labs will start next week. Um, uh, that's why I wrote notes so that I could remember stuff. Um, oh, yeah, good. I gave you a sheet of paper with the notes on it. This is going to happen every single lecture. There will be one sheet of paper that you have to pick up if you want to take notes for yourself or to just keep and stash away someplace. You don't have to take one, and I'll decrease the number that I print in response to the interest um, so that I save at least a tree or two. So then if you, um, if you are looking at that sheet of paper and, and you notice that I didn't make it all the way through everything that was on the piece of paper in the lecture, don't worry. I know that too. And what, that doesn't mean I'm going to hold you accountable for what's written on that piece of paper without me ever lecturing about it, because frankly, it's incomprehensible. But eventually, I will get to it. Eventually, we will cover the material that's on there. Okay? So we might not make it all the way today, but we'll get there sometime. Okay, that's what I want to remember. Okay, so what is this course about? We're going to take a little sidestep. We're not actually going to follow the rule, which is to do the plan. We're not going to do the plan. We're going, to, we're going to do something slightly different first, which is to tell you what the course is about. So this is what the course is about. The course is about problems like this. So you are at a hockey game, and you find a wallet. This is at Rogers Arena. And you find a wallet, and inside of the wallet is an ID card that says Roger. That's weird. It's Roger's arena, and you have Roger's wallet. It's kind of funny. But you want to return Roger's wallet to Roger. Okay, so that's the question. How do you go about doing this? Now, I know what you would do. You would take the wallet to the lost and found, which is in the arena, and you would drop it off, and then everybody would be happy because Roger would eventually realize he's lost his wallet. He would go to lost and found, he would pick up his wallet. You would only have to go to one place. Forget that. There is no lost and found in this hockey arena. For some reason, it's closed. Okay? So I want you to think creatively about how you would find Roger to give him back his wallet. There are a lot of people in this arena. You don't know where he is. So anyway, I'd like you to talk amongst yourselves, and I'll give you about three minutes or so to see what kind of solutions you come up with for this interesting problem of finding Roger and returning his wallet. Okay? Go. <laughs>
Is everybody everybody okay? Are you, is somebody still working? Like they got a great idea, but they're just almost there. It's okay. I, I have to tell you, this is this is one of those things where there's no correct answer. I just like to see what people think about this problem. And so if if you feel brave, uh, who has a uh, a candidate solution for finding Roger. Roger. Um, you check his wallet. Um, so you get information like what the ethnicity or age or gender is. I mean, I'm assuming he's male because his name's Roger. And then you completely disregard all the other things that you would have otherwise had to do through brute force. So you cut down the potential Rogers to a very small amount. And then you just check everyone who fits the description that you have. But how would you do that in a hockey in a hockey stadium? I mean, we're in this place. And, I mean, are you suggesting? I mean, let's just—I'll give you his driver's license. It's in his wallet, so you can pull it out. You got a photo. You got everything about him. You know. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Yeah, you just impersonate a police officer. Okay, perfect. So that's perfect. That's exactly what I'm suggesting you do. Everybody, go out and impersonate a police officer. No, but yeah. So that's a that's a, a viable solution, a perfect solution, a solution which is. Uh, what I would call a sequential solution. You go around and you check everybody. Are you, you're not, no. You just go around and around and around and around. It would take a while because that's a large number of people, but you would eventually succeed at finding Roger and you would you would be happy and declare victory. No? Is there another suggestion for how one might do this? No, you have two suggestions, only one. Okay. You can probably check with this address on the ID. <laughs> wow. Okay, just check for the address on his ID and go to his house. <laughs> That's a brilliant idea. He would be a little nervous for a while, but what a great idea. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. If you throw the wallet into the hockey arena, I think that Roger threw it, so not to find Roger to give him wallet. This, I love this one. This is called the pass the buck solution. Like, <laughs> literally. No, it's like, okay, that one I've never heard before. The address one I've heard before, but the, not, the, not the one where you throw it onto the ice. I mean, it's somebody else's problem now. Uh, yeah, you and, okay. Yeah, you. Oh, well, in real life, I would normally call the bank. You know, the alternative to that, they can easily look them up. But in a situation that's more related to computer science, I would go down every row and like ask one person to pass a message along that if their name's Roger, stand up. <laughs> and then you only have to say that to like the 20 people, but it gets around the entire group. Very good. This is a parallel solution. This is like a solution requiring processors. <laughs> Everybody in the whole arena is a processor, and you're taking advantage of their computational ability to propagate messages and to query themselves of whether they're in Roger or not. So this is a great solution because it makes things faster than sequential. You only have to do a certain amount of sequential work, and then that sequential work sweeps through the entire thing. Is that the, is that the most parallel you could imagine you, you know, taking advantage of parallelism in this case? And you walk up this aisle, and I ask here, and here, and here, and here. Is there another more parallel solution, something that would use even more of your processors? Anybody? I mean, it's a good suggestion. I like parallelism. It's a great, great suggestion. But yeah. I guess in addition to like having one person in each row like tell everyone else in the row, or like pass down the message, they could like after like passing down the message to one person, they could like pass it down to the next row. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, in fact, you're the only person that has, starting off, you're the only person that knows that you have Roger's wallet. <laughs> but if you tell everybody around you, everybody that's within the range of your voice, then they all know. And then each one of them can say to everybody within the range of their voice that they're looking for Roger. If you're, if you're Roger, stand up. They can do this. And so that's sort of like maximizing the amount of parallelism that you can get. Now, if we did something like this, how much time would it take to find Roger? Suppose that one of these announcements to your neighbors about, you know, I've got Roger's wallet. Does your name Roger stand up? This announcement takes constant time, like it just takes a second. How much time is it going to take to find Roger? What does it depend on? De depends on the number of people in kind of a strange way. How, mu how much time does it take? 
what property of the people would make this very slow and what property of the people would make it very quick? I mean, we have a particular configuration, which is a hockey arena, but I'm conjecturing that there's another hockey arena, you know, maybe in a different configuration. And what configuration would make this be slow? And what configuration would make this be quick? The attention span of the people. It's a hockey game. We're all cheering. <laughs> <laughs> the attention span of the people. No, no, no. They're going to play the game. Oh, okay. Because they might be Rogers sometime. And so they're willing to play the game. But what configuration is going to make this fast? What configuration is going to make this slow? Let's see, who hasn't? You haven't. Uh, so if we're imagining that everyone in the arena is in one like, single line, then like, essentially we're just like, getting, we may be reaching the two people next to you. So if everyone's in like, a half crowd where everyone's like, they're surrounded by people, then one person's message can reach uh, you know, everyone around them because there's two people next to them. That's right. So what is, what is the running time of this process going to be? As a feature, of that clumpiness. There's a feature of that clumpiness that makes it fast, and there's a feature of it that makes it slow. What is that feature? What's the feature of clumpiness that makes it fast? How many people can pass on the message at the same time? Mm, no, um, sort of, but not exactly. I mean, it's, you're, you're going to like say, what? This is when you hear it. The number of neighbors? Yeah, the number of neighbors is important, but if those number of neighbors is actually reused again and again and again, you know, then they sort of just waste it. Is it related to how graph is laid out? Yeah, it's related to the distance between you and Roger. If there's, how many hops are there from you to Roger? If it's small, then Roger's going to hear about it pretty quickly. If it's large, like in a line, or the line of people is on forever, it's going to take forever. But if it's a short distance in terms of the number of hops that the message has to go, that's what's really going to determine how long this process, this parallel process, is going to take. And we'll, we're going to talk about graphs, and we'll talk about diameter, we'll talk about properties of those graphs that would help with getting messages quickly or slowly transmitted. So that's a good suggestion. Any other suggestions? I want to tell you my suggestion. Can I tell you mine? Here's mine. Sorry to jump in rudely, but that's anyway. Uh, you brought your drone to this hockey game. <laughs> and you take his ID card and you put the picture into the drone and it does facial recognitions as it flies around the entire hockey ring while you are just watching. It's entertaining and, well, okay, it's a lousy solution, but anyway. That was my solution. Uh, who had another solution? It's a hockey arena, so most likely Roger would book a ticket. Just exit the game for five minutes, go to the... Because whenever you buy a ticket for a sports game, you don't ask for ID or a credit card. If he lost his wallet, you can link the credit card to which seat he's in. You can literally find out which seat he's in, and voila. Very good. That's an excellent solution. An excellent solution. So basically, sacrifice yourself for Roger. No, no, you'd have your wallet too. So you could get in as well. Okay, that's good. What if Roger's blood used to get? That's not good. Any, yeah, do you have another suggestion? So since there's like so many people from where the rink is back to like the back of the seating area, you have to get through all those people, so I'd say maybe get one person to go around the left side, one, and then you go around the right side, so you can distribute the message to all the different groups of people. Yeah. So you're just going around the whole thing by yourself. Maybe your running is faster than the message actually traveling by hops. That's also shortcuts and graphs are great things to have. <laughs> yeah, one more, and then we're going to be. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's an A system at hockey games, so you can just leave it to announce his name. Yeah, what a ridiculous question this is. There's a PA system. Why don't you just get on the PA system and say, Roger, this guy has your wallet, or whoever has your wallet. We have it. Come and get it. Why would that not necessarily be a great solution? What's, what's the interesting property about broadcast? This is a broadcast message. Well, there could be multiple Rogers, but it will work. I mean, all the Rogers will go, okay, oh, yeah, I got mine, or, uh, yeah, whatever. But the thing is, it's very expensive. 
Broadcast is a very expensive mechanism because it shuts everything else down. There's no more communication. That's why they use it at the hockey game to tell you about the hockey game because you can't really see that puck. So they have to tell you what's going on. And that has to stop in order for them to announce things about Roger. So it's a great solution. But if you had a measure of expense which was sort of telling about the ability to communicate, everything has to stop down, stop because of the broadcast. And that can be expensive. So we'll look at other measures of expense other than just time, other than just the number of hops, for example, or the sequential looking and comparing against everybody in the arena. We'll also consider other cost measures like space or maybe things like broadcast. Um, and they're all what this course is about. This course is about designing algorithms. But there's another thing this course is about. Uh, i got to talk faster. Um, whoops, that's one way to do it. Another thing that this course is about, which is um, closets. No, it's about, uh, take a look at these two closets. So this is uh, like my organizational skills. This is like my wife's organizational skills. So which closet would you want to have your clothes in? I mean, who would you like to have organize your closet? Me or my wife? Your wife. Why? Why? This is a perfectly reasonable closet. What's wrong with this closet? It's reasonable to you. It's not even reasonable to me, really. But I, I mean, why, why is this a better closet than this closet? What is the feature of these two closets that separates them? Yeah. One's organized, one's not. One's organized and one's not. So what? As my daughter says, why can't I just jam all my clothes into one box? Easier to search through. Easier to search through. So there's certain operations you want to perform on your clothes, like select pants and shirts that match. So we'll do that. And this closet, or maybe organized by color, or organized by type, organized in several ways, allows you to do that operation faster than that closet. That's what this course, at the heart of this course, that's what this course is about. It's about how to organize data so that you can perform operations, like algorithms, more efficiently. Okay? So it's true that all programs manipulate data. It's the, the, the choice that you have, it's not the programmer, the choice that you have is how you structure that data. How do you store it? How do you how do you choose to store it so that you can manipulate it efficiently? And that choice has implications on whether the, whether the program that you write is fast, whether it's uh, comprehensible, like if people can't understand it, they can't do anything, or how, how much memory it takes. So that's the, really at the heart of this, of this course. This is a data structures and algorithms course. And really the algorithms are coming in service of the data structures, the structuring of the data. Everybody good? Here are the goals. You should become familiar with fundamental data structures. We'll see a bunch of data structures, way of, ways of structuring data that show up a lot in computer science, uh, and learn when to use them and when not to use them. Uh, improve your ability to solve problems abstractly. Uh, by abstractly, I mean thinking about the problem uh, independent of the programming language independent of the actual implementation in machine code. It's an abstract thought process like we were doing with Rogers Arena. It's trying to come up with a scheme for solving it in the abstract, and then implementation comes secondly. Uh, and uh, we we'll also want to improve your ability to analyze algorithms, to count the efficiency, the number of steps that the algorithm takes, um, prove correctness, uh, compare algorithms based on their performance criteria, and then finally become modestly skilled at C++, unless you're already skilled at C++, and in that case, we want to make you more skilled. So there's a tailor on the end of this, but this is largely on your own. Every year that I teach this class, I get and read teaching evaluations. Every year, I get and read teaching evaluations that say, the instructor should teach us more about C++ in class because we don't know C++ 
And we should learn it in class. No. I don't believe that. I believe that you get more at this point in your career, having learned programming languages, and you probably know more than one at this point. Well, don't you know Java and don't you know Racket and maybe even Python and perhaps even something else? You know enough languages at this point, you can learn another one on your own. And the benefit of doing that is that you start to learn how to learn programming languages, which is an incredibly important thing to have in your toolbox when you get out in the real world because there are new programming languages and special purpose programming languages that pop up all the time. So I'm not shy about the fact that we don't teach C++ in class. And yet, and yet, we have a C++ boot camp, which is happening September 8th, 9th, and 10th. And I just found out the, I wrote them down someplace. I just found out the uh, places. This is a C++ tutorial. They are in the evenings from like 6 to 9. 6 to 9. That's a 6. PM. And I think the one on the 8th is uh, ESB 1018, 1013. And then the 9th is wood uh, two, and the tenth is uh, uh, the learning center uh, one eighty two, and these will be sort of like very quick, almost syntactic like descriptions of C plus plus and good C plus plus programming. You can get all of this stuff online, so it's not like these tutorials are required. They are different topics on each one of the three days. You can go to all of them, or you can go to one of them, but there's no requirement about that. Yeah? Will there be a place to see what, what the topics are beforehand? Uh, there is, and it's called the course website. And if you go up onto the course website and you look for, strangely enough, it's under lectures. Don't know why, but anyway, under lectures, there's like this stuff about C++ tutorials. See that? Yep. Is this the Sunday 8th? 8th is a Sunday. That's right. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> now, you're saying, first of all, this is crazy because it's Sunday. Secondly, it's crazy because why don't we just record these things and just put them on the website and you can watch them at your leisure? We try. Last year, the first one, the sound didn't record. The second day, the video didn't record, but the sound did record. So we're trying again. So there is theoretically the possibility that even if you miss these, they will be up on the website as video resources. But maybe not. I think they will, because you know technology gets better most of the time. So anyway, if you miss them, we will try to fill in with video stuff, or at least give you resources to do it. There's actually resources on the web right now. For that. Okay? Good? <coughs> okay, we gotta hurry. Okay, analysis of an algorithm. It gives you insight into correctness, how long programs run, uh, and it also allows you to think about alternatives to a particular program when you find out that the one you've written is too slow. Uh, we typically talk about the input size as being an important parameter. And size varies from problem to problem. And the thing that maybe we're interested in is the running time of the, of the program, the running time of the algorithm, as a function of that input size. So if Roger's arena has more people in it and you're running a linear search for Roger, then you would imagine that the running time of that search scales linearly. It's some like constant times n, the amount of time that you'd have to spend doing it. So the real question though is, who cares? Because computers are really, really, really fast. Like this is a typical fast computer. It operates one operation per picosecond, which is, which is 10 to the minus 12th seconds, which is 10, that's a 10. That's not 16. It's 10 to the minus 12 seconds. 10 to the minus 12 seconds is no time at all. 
light travels a millimeter in 3.3 picoseconds. Okay? So think about that. You got operations that are performing at a one picosecond rate. How is that possible? Unless everything is really close together. Fortunately, everything is really close together inside your computer. So, okay, and if I ran this on inputs of size 10, and I had different programs running, one that ran in log n time, one in n time, one in n log n, one in n squared, and one in two to the n, then the amount of time that it would take is written here. One picosecond, it's over before you even blink. And one down to one nanosecond, that's over before you even blink. This is 10 to the minus ninth. So why are we talking about efficiency? It's like done. Okay, because we don't solve problems of size 10. We solve problems of size 100. And if we solve a problem of size 100, at a picosecond rate, then uh, everything looks okay except that we get down to this guy, the exponential running algorithm, 2 to the n time. 2 to the n is like what time it would take if we decided to consider every subset of people in this room, like just you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. That would take, to enumerate all of those, would take two to the n time. If we do that with 100 people, it would take 32 billion years. Uh, that's a little long. Nobody's going to wait around for that. So you got to come up with a different algorithm. But so this is fine. This is one microsecond. That's not bad. For n squared, one microsecond is nothing. I mean, the other one goes to 10 to the 289 uh, seconds, but that's, you know, like ridiculous. So we'll stop looking at that. Uh, uh, 100 microseconds when you have inputs of size 10,000. That's a hefty input. That's a reasonable size input. But 100 microseconds is nothing. So why should I worry about running time? All of these things, 10 milliseconds, I blink, it takes me 300 milliseconds, even if I'm fast. One second for 10 to the sixth. But if I get, finally I get up to something like 10 to the ninth, now it's interesting because it takes one week to solve a problem if my algorithm takes time n squared. So you're thinking to yourself at this point, I don't know anything that's of size 10 to the ninth. Why do I care? about this class and its efficiency. You do know something that's 10 to the ninth. Look inside. Your genome is about three times 10 to the ninth in length. And if you want to find whether you have a disease, you have to match it against something. How much time does that matching take? How much time does alignment take between genomes? Well, the old algorithms took n squared time. The new algorithms don't. They take something like n log n. And that makes all the difference. So now it's nine milliseconds as opposed to one week to find out what your disease is and maybe get you some sort of medicine. So it makes a difference. It's just that, and also these aren't the only running times. There are also running times of things that take like n cubed and n to the fourth and n to the fifth and all other things. So efficiency does matter, but really what the point of this slide is, is that it matters eventually as n gets bigger. And that's the thing that we're going to focus on in this course is running times as they get asymptotically, as n, the size gets asymptotically larger. Now, if you come up with an n log n algorithm that is unbelievably complicated, and you come up with an n squared algorithm that's beautiful and easy to implement, and you're never going to run it on more than inputs of size 10,000 or 100,000 or a million. What would you do? I'd go with the n squared solution. Actually, I'd go with the n log n solution because then I could write a paper. <laughs> but you know, you have to balance things, which is efficiency versus maintainability versus understandability. It's all the stuff we're going to talk about in this course. It's all part of this course. Uh, we're done. I will see you uh, Friday. Friday. Do I need the textbook to fix class, or do I get some? Uh, so you don't need the textbook I ever. Okay. Uh,